All right, church, are you glad to be here? Say yeah. yeah. Come on, welcome everybody at both of our locations here in Boca, in Deerfield, and of course our church family that's tuning in online. So, so grateful to be here. Anybody get anything from Christine Kane last week? And that was so awesome. And yes, Easter is right around the corner. We're really excited about it. Those invite cards are in what we, if you're here in the room, we call them in the, in the West Wing out there or in the welcome room out through those doors. Go to victory.org slash Easter, get all the shareable graphics, like all that kind of stuff. Man, let's go nuts. Let's have God's house completely filled in all of our eight services. My goodness. And no, my Easter outfit is not ready yet. <laughs> Been a little busy, but um, no, man, I'm excited. It's going to be really, really great. So, hey, listen, today is uh, what we call Palm Sunday, and today's message is not a kind of classic Palm Sunday message, but we do want to bring honor to the fact and awareness to the reality that what we celebrate on Palm Sunday is this is actually five days before Jesus went to the cross for us. He actually uh, entered Jerusalem riding on a colt, or as we know it, as a donkey, and people would praise his name and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They laid down palm branches to just prepare the way for him to come. And if you're like in the mood for like a good classic Palm Sunday, like I want to know more about that even historically. Uh, I preached that last year on Palm Sunday. And uh, you might remember this message um, with the donkey that we brought in. So you can check that out on our YouTube if you want to see that. That was awesome. I fed him a carrot and everything. And it was great. It was great. Proud of our team for making that happen. But um, what, what we are doing this week as a church family, you know, Easter Sunday, I mean, we're making it about the resurrection. We're making it about that main thing. We're, we're going to preach the message in its most accessible form for people to know about Jesus. But this weekend, we're closing out our Something Has to Break series. Someone say, Something Has to Break. And I want to remind you, and, and from some of you, just going to get you up to speed because uh, maybe you're just joining us for the first time. But we've been in a series, and this is the fourth and final week of it called Something Has to Break. And one, week one, we said, what is your something? You see, the Bible is really clear. The Bible says that we have an enemy and that he's real. Did you know that? Yeah, in John 10.10, 10, it says that his purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy from the children of God. And yet Jesus came. Come on, somebody. Anybody excited about Jesus? <laughs> That he came that we may have life and have it to the full. So when there are things, friends, and I'm not talking about our little things. Like, I'm not talking about, like, man, that person cut me off. That's the enemy. That's the devil. I'm not talking about, like, I can't wake up on time for that's the enemy. That's the devil. Like, I'm talking about things that have been crushing you, oppressing you, overpowering you, right? Some for years, some for decades, some maybe for generations. And we believe that God has something to say about that. Yeah. It's not just like, hey, his heart isn't just that you maybe learn some better coping mechanisms. It's that he actually has something to say about those things. Are you hearing me? And so we, when we said, what is your something? Identify it because you cannot conquer what you don't confront and you cannot confront what you don't identify. And so we said, what is your something? And many of you wrote down week one, what that thing is, what those things are, what those lies have been, what that oppression has been, what that consistent disappointment has been. And then in week two, we talked about the rhythm of breakthrough that, hey, friends, like, let's be honest. If we spiritually speaking, biblically speaking, even like we might set ourselves up for disappointment when we think that now we've confronted something that has maybe plagued our family line for even generations and that it's just going to be gone in a, in a second, but that there is a consistency and there's a rhythm to breakthrough in following Jesus and believing for our healing and believing for our freedom. Come on. So there's a rhythm to that oftentimes. I love when God does it in an instant and in a moment. And I believe that he can, and I've seen him do it. And it's amazing. But a lot of times we're following him and there's a cadence and a rhythm of holding Jesus's hand, receiving the power of the Holy Spirit and seeing that come to pass. And then Pastor Eli preached the third week on setting the wrong thing right. Because friend, whatever that thing is, maybe something that has been done to you that you did not deserve. Maybe something that you have been really struggling with shame about for a decision that you made. Friend, I'm so sorry for that, but I just want you to know that our God is a God who restores and things that were wrong, whether caused by you or victimized to you, happened to you, he is a God who sets the wrong thing right. That's the God that we serve and we hold on to that truth. Come on, someone give him praise. And so I'm excited I'm really, really excited about this because we're going to close it out. We're calling this message 
The prisoners are listening. Come on, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for all that you have for us. Man, I just know you're gonna do something new. I'm sensing new beginnings for people today. I'm sensing hope. I'm sensing breakthrough for your people today. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your word. Help me preach it well and preach the truth. Your kingdom, your words, your thoughts, because your thoughts are higher than our thoughts and your ways are higher than our ways. And Lord, I just ask you to speak through me. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said in a loud voice, amen, let's go. Charles Spurgeon said, the preaching of Christ is the whip that flogs the devil. The preaching of Christ is the thunderbolt, the sound of which makes all hell shake. (laughs) Sometimes I like some of that language. I just, I'm like, yes, let's go. I need it. You know, we talk about um, in the very beginning of the series, In Numbers chapter 13, how the Israelites, they're wanting to inherit the promised land because you see God led his chosen people out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And yet as they're on their way out, well, they're human, they're fickle, we all are. They're murmuring, they're complaining, they're whining. They have this promise that they would inherit this promised land. But there's a problem with the promise. The problem is that there's something that stands between them and the promise. That's giants that are inheriting this land. And so 12 spies went out and they spied out the land and then they brought back a report. It said 10 of the 12 all brought a bad report. But two, Joshua and Caleb had a different report. And the scripture said they had a different spirit about them that said, yes, we can. And yes, God will. And we've seen what he's done. Come on, let's go. Let's get it together, people. Stop putting your head between your knees and crying. We can do this. It was a different spirit in believing in God. It says this, Numbers 13, 32 through 33. I'm kind of bringing us back so that I can slingshot us forward, okay? It says, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. But I see a problem with this when I read this. Watch me. I talked about perspective. We've been talking about perspective. We are a church that has great faith, crazy faith. In fact, one of our values is we have limitless faith. Nothing is impossible for our God. But perspective, it means so much. Because if these men brought a report that said these giants, now remember, they were secretly spying out the land. If they were secretly spying out the land, hiding in the bushes or whatever, right? then how would they bring back a report that says, and we were like grasshoppers in their sight? How would they say that? That was their own opinion of themselves that they were stating as fact. Perspective is really, really important. No, Joshua and Caleb had a different report. What did they say? They, They said, they will become bread for us. That's what they said. They believed in the power of God. They had a covenant. They had a promise that changes things. The people, the giants in the land didn't have a covenant. They didn't have a promise. God's people did. They said they will become bread for us. It's a perspective shift that has to happen. It's in, and it starts in the mind. Where in Wearsby said, once the walls in the mind have been torn down, the door to the heart can be opened. My prayer for you as we preach faith and the goodness of God and the power of God, my prayer for you is that your heart would be opened, that the things that would be quick to stand in the way and protect your heart from daring to believe would be silenced, that they would kneel before the power of God. It's really important that our minds and that our hearts are open and so That was what was happening, Joshua and Caleb. I'm like, I'm inspired forever when I read that now. I'm like, in Jesus' name, that's the kind of spirit that I'm gonna have. Friends, especially on this side of the cross, we saying you can do anything, you can do anything. It's because the prophesied one, they prophesied about for years and years and years and generations, he came, he did the impossible. He died on a cross and he rose again for us. He can do anything. So I can for sure have the kind of faith that Joshua and Caleb had. We're on this side of the promise. And so... Fast forward 500-ish years from what's happening with Joshua and Caleb. Mind you, don't don't miss this. 
the doubters, the murmurers, the grumblers, the complainers, they did not get to inherit the promised land. Joshua and Caleb did. They complained and they complained and they complained. And upon further study, I was like, you know what? The Hebrew word for complain means to stay the night. I think about the Psalm that tells us, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. But the Hebrew word for complain means to stay the night. We can sometimes stay the night in the valley we were never intended to. We walk through it. It's about a perspective. It's about a faith. So fast forward 500 years, we find ourselves in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I encourage you to go to your Bibles, open your Bibles, or go on your mobile device. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Old Testament, I'm reading out of the New King James Version. And buckle up, because for some of you, this is going to be more reading than you've done this whole year. We're going to read 24 verses. You can do it. Are you with me? Can you hang in there? When your brain just wanders away, bring it back. Bring it back. 24 verses. We can do this. You got to get this. It says, and it happened after this. Okay, so, so sorry. Let me, let me more, more context. Um, 500-ish years later, God's chosen people. Sadly, they continued to grumble and they continued to complain and they continued to divide. So much so that the kingdom, the children of Israel actually split into two different kingdoms. The northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom was called Judah. And there were many different kings that led through seasons. And here we have King Jehoshaphat leading the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And now they're in trouble. Here's what it says. Verse one, it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Now listen, Bible scholars uh, debate the name of these people. Was it the Mayanites? Was it the Edomites? Was it uh, the New King James Version? Goes on to tell us that that third group is a group called the people of Mount Seir. Okay, so you've got Ammonites and you've got Moabites and you've got the people of Mount Seir all surrounding now God's chosen people led by Jehoshaphat, the king, the king of Judah. It says, then some came and told Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Temar, which is En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Good, that's the right thing. He feared, he got this bad report. What did he do? He prayed, he sought after God, good. Verse four, so Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah that came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, I want pause for a second. I want you to imagine that modern day today. There's fear, there's chaos, there's all kinds of stuff, crazy stuff going on around us. Imagine that, and we come together in the temple of God together, and we seek God, and we have something to say, and we wait on him. And here's what Jehoshaphat said as he stood in the temple, as they're surrounded on all sides from these people who are not coming to hang out with them and have a good time. It says, Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before people, Israel, the people of Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. Does anybody know that's the nature of our God? He hears and he saves. And now, verse 10, stay with me. Hear are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. They turned, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Well, now here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you gave us to inherit. Oh, our God, will you, uh, where am I? Oh, go, you will not, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Have you ever felt like that? nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Yeah. 
Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and the children stood before the Lord. And then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. Now don't miss that. I said a bunch of things and you were like, that's where you checked out right there. Listen, this man was a Levite. He was a Levite. The Levites led God's people in praise and in worship, in song, in singing. It's important. You're going to see why. Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And he said, verse 15, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. We sang that in our first song. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up against the, come up by the ascent of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle, but position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Pause for a moment. He's literally now, like, he's taken over. He's giving very specific instructions because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Friend, I love when God does that. He speaks through people. He speaks faith. He speaks power. He prophesies through them. And in this case, for sure, you better hope that he was right because he's giving some very specific instruction that could lead to the decimation of God's people if he's not right. But let's keep reading. He says, don't fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Okay, friends, don't miss it. There's chaos all around them. There's a bad report all around them. They're in the temple. They're with God's people. They are praising. They are worshiping. They are seeking God. Verse 19, then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord of God. Israel with the uh, with voices loud and high so they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa and as they went out Jehoshaphat stood and said hear me O Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem believe someone say believe Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people he appointed those who should sing to the Lord And who should praise the beauty of his holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Just a few more verses. Now, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah and they were defeated. Wait, say what? What are you talking about? What do you mean? Who? What? When? Where? What? Watch. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. The enemies are now fighting each other. And God's people are praising and worshiping. Verse 24, so when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness... They looked toward the multitude and there were the dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. I used to play this game called Starcraft when I was in middle school. And you kind of like form your whole own army. And then you play other people from across the world. And they use colorful language. And um, like, I I mean, I'm humble, but I was really good. Like, that's not a badge of honor. <laughs> I don't play video games anymore. But um, I would like wipe out all my enemies. And then like if the game was just about to be over, if you did this before the game concluded, then it would extend. And you could go into the options and then choose to no longer be an ally to anyone else anymore. And then I would turn against all of my allies that helped me wipe out the enemies. And then the language got really colorful. Um, but I'm like, dude, that's what's happening here. Like, they're just taking care of each other. As God, and God's people are praising 
Now, there's a few observations from this text that I really want you to get because you can come back to this and you should come back to this when you find yourself in a hard place and you see a sequence here. Number one, look at verse three. It said, and Jehoshaphat feared because he was a human because we're all human and stuff happens. He feared, but what did he do? He set himself to seek the Lord and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. You know, listen, we're a fast paced church. We take ground, we have faith. We say, yes, God can, but let me tell you what we do first and foremost above everything, we pray and we seek God. In the beginning of each year, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. Again, in the fall, we're gonna do seven days of prayer and fasting, seven days in a row, one hour prayer and worship services. Be looking out for that. You're gonna hear more about that. We are constantly saying, God first. God, we will not go if you do not send us. We will not go where your spirit does not lead us. That's how we get into trouble. But if you say go, we're going, we're going. And it's not by power and it's not by might. Watch this, verses five through seven. Watch this, you need to get this and you need to practice this and you need to apply this. Jehoshaphat, verse five through seven, he stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord. And he said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Verse seven, are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants? He's reminding himself and he's reminding others and he's reminding God of who he is and what his nature is and what he's done to remind him what he's gonna do now. And said, are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. Watch. What he's doing is he's building up his own spirit. He's building up the spirits of those around him and under his leadership. He's ministering to the Lord and reminding his God who he is and what his nature is. And so we, friends, have no reason to fear. There is no reason to fear because I know he is, I am still standing. He's been with me through everything. What should have destroyed me didn't. If my God is for me, what can stand against me? You got to build yourself up and preach to yourself sometimes. Come on. And they sing. Verse 21 says they sing, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Forever. It endures forever. Not for one generation. Not for once upon a time. Not for when this was written, forever, for you, for me, today. His mercy endures forever. And it was broken, fallen, confused, misguided people that God was defending. And that's good news for you, and that's good news for me. Because we can be so quick to disqualify ourselves from the mercy of God. But he's kinder than you think he is. And he's more patient with you than you are with yourself. So he stands up and he fights for his people. Do you know that when you're surrounded by enemies and you praise God, it causes confusion in the enemy camp? Confusion. What confusion must have been going on to cause the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the people of Mount Seir to just start turning on each other because they were greatly outnumbering God's people and going, this is gonna be a cakewalk. We've done way harder things than this. We're gonna clean them up and then go get lunch. And instead, now, why are they praising? Why are they worshiping? Why are they joyful? Why do they have some kind of a hope? Because they had a covenant, because they had a promise, and there is confusion in the enemy camp, and they just start offing each other. Sorry if this language offends you. But there's also a New Testament breakthrough that I want us to look at today, and that's about 800 years later on the other side of the cross. Jesus came, he died, and he rose again, and now people are preaching. They're preaching the good news of Jesus. They're preaching forgiveness of sins. They're preaching that you can be given a new start and a new name, and that the blood of Jesus covers over every shortcoming and every failure and every fear and every devastating circumstance, and that it triumphs over the enemy, and they're preaching this good news, and Paul and 
Silas are in Philippi and Acts chapter 16 says this about 800 years later, there's a connection between these two stories I want you to see. It says, then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes. Speaking of Paul and Silas, this is happening to them and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Quick pause, because friends, I know we're so obsessed and we really, really want an easy life and we really want Christianity to be popular and for it to be cool. But the reality is since the beginning, it has not been. It has been different than the world. It has been odd. And friends, it is actually a threat to corrupt powers and the evil forces of this world. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. What were they doing? They were praying and they were singing hymns to God. Makes no sense. Doesn't seem like a situation that calls for singing. (laughs) Unless you're a little bit crazy. Crazy's good sometimes. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately, someone say immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed and the keeper of the prison awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they said, believe, someone say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Paul and Silas go on to preach to the household and they all profess faith in Jesus, get baptized and are saved. Paul and Silas are not denying the chains They're not denying the oppression. They're not denying the injustice. They're not denying the situation, but they are choosing a perspective that rises above it. And Job 35, 10 says that God will give us songs in the night. Have you ever needed a song in the night? It's one thing to sing when everything's going good and I close the business deal and my, my, I, I got what I wanted and I leveled up, but it's another thing to sing songs in the night when perhaps your soul needs it the most. They didn't deny it. They praised and they worshiped. And I want you to see this and I want you to write it down. What ties these two breakthroughs together? Old Testament breakthrough, New Testament breakthrough separated by 800 years. What ties these two things together? It's four things, write them down. One is prayer. Right out the gate, prayer. What did, what, what, what did it just say, right? So we, we saw it, Jehoshaphat, he feared and he sought the Lord and he prayed. And it said that Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They prayed and they praised. And they had faith. You need prayer. You need to praise. You need to have faith. Jehoshaphat built himself up in faith and those around him. Paul and Silas did and the prisoners were listening, proclaiming truth, faith, and perspective. Who is God in light of all of this? Yes, this truth might be around us. It might be happening. I'm not denying it, but I'm gonna have a higher perspective. Prayer, praise, faith, and perspective. You gotta get this because you need to know something. Too many Christians are trying to use human strategies to combat demonic schemes. And it's so frustrating and it's not working. You got to understand that you have a power on the inside of you. It is the spirit of God. And the word of God has something to say about all of your somethings, the things that are crushing, oppressing, 
and overpowering you. And I, I didn't see it then, but I see it now. I love how God does this. If you were following along in the series, you remember the rhythm of breakthrough week two. I talked about how hey, we got to have some patience with some of this stuff. We got to have a healthy perspective. We said that there's, there's four practices in the rhythm of breakthrough and they are this and watch, you'll see it now. You'll see it now because it's exactly the four things that were all common denominators in the breakthroughs in second Chronicles 20 and in Acts chapter 16. One, I said, get close to Jesus. What is that? It's prayer. Two, I said, worship Jesus. What is that? That's praise. Three, we said, work with Jesus and visualize your freedom. Faith. Build yourself up. And four, accept that it might not happen overnight. That's perspective. That's good perspective. My prayer for this whole series, if you hear nothing else, nothing else is that you would see and that you would know and that you would begin to believe that greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world and that you have been given weapons to fight with. Weapons. I'm talking about spiritual warfare. This is a prophetic series. And Ephesians, if you've grown up in church, you maybe heard about the armor of God. We talk about it. It's so good. It's so good. We We need to know it. It's so real. That's not this message today. I can't unpack. I wish I had more time. But what I am sensing and I have been sensing is that maybe too often times Christians, as we remind ourselves of Ephesians chapter six, we focus so much on those defensive things, the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. I think about the helmet. I think about the right, I think about the breastplate. These things protect me. We need those. Come on. Because we live in a fallen world where the enemy does have some dominion on this earth and he does want to steal, kill and destroy. But friends, the, the armor is not all about defense. We have a sword too. Come on, somebody. I said that we have a sword too. We have a sword too. It's the sword of the spirit. You can't win battles just on defense all the time. You gotta be on offense too. And I'm not talking about power and might of your own. I'm talking about the spirit of God that is greater in you than he that is in the world. The worship team better get out here because I'm preaching, I'm getting excited. And you need to see it You need to see that even in this scripture, Ephesians chapter six, where it talks about the sword of the spirit, pull it up, please, Ephesians six. It says, in the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. In here as well are the four things, prayer, praise, faith and perspective pull them up with the underlines please where i highlight it number one is that it said they're praying always do you see it praying always we should be praying always go down a little further to the bottom there it says that i may open my mouth boldly there's praise there's praise and then it says and that in the word of God, number one, the word of God, we build ourselves up with faith, with the truth, with the word of God, and then perspective, because even here it says to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Not everything is just a quick fix, an easy thing. I slapped a Bible verse on it and told myself everything was gonna be fine. No, there is a perseverance and a supplication. Oftentimes that is need, but look at those common denominators in our two breakthroughs and in this spiritual warfare verse of Ephesians chapter six that we study. There's prayer, praise, faith, and perspective. And our praise and our worship, it confuses the enemy. It frustrates the enemy and it should Why? Because he's thrown so much at you. He's thrown so much at you. He got creative. He tried things. They came out of nowhere. They came out of the left. They came out of the right. You didn't see that one coming. You thought once you got over one, there was something else. And yet, even though he's thrown so much at you, come on, band, even though he's thrown so much at you, you're still praising and you're still worshiping and you're still declaring that he is a God that redeems and that restores and that is just getting started in your life. And it confuses the enemy. It confuses the enemy. 
For the preaching of Christ is not just to out there, but it's to in here. And what did Spurgeon say? The preaching of Christ is the whip that flogs the devil. The preaching of Christ is the thunderbolt, the sound of which makes all hell shake. And final scripture is 2 Corinthians 10 that says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the tearing down of strongholds. Strongholds. Week one, many of you, you indicated many things. You wrote these things down. You brought out into the light, maybe some of you for the first time, your somethings. Anxiety, guilt, shame, unbelief, sickness, addiction, suicidal thoughts, heartbreak, insecurity, loneliness, sexual sin, hardship and suffering, financial debt, feeling like I can't win. I'm just here to tell you today that God has something to say about your somethings. And at the risk of sounding like I'm oversimplifying some very complex matters, I I don't mean to do that. I hope you know as your pastor, I pray, I seek God, I humble myself, and I try to be one of the most practical application pastors that I can possibly be. I'm not making light of, of really difficult things, but what I am telling you is that maybe many have tried so many human things. You've tried so many things. You've sought out different types of help and counsel and things. And as you hear me say it almost every week, I'm big on mental health. I'm big on having a counselor. I'm big on being healthy and figuring out what's going on with your body and like all kinds of stuff. I'm I'm really, really big on it. But how often do we skip over? Like we go straight to what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Jehoshaphat feared and he prayed. Why sometimes do we say we've tried all these things? I don't know. I've gotten, I've got counsel. I paid of consultant, I this, I that, I whatever. And then I guess all that's left to do is pray. When pray, praying is our first line of offense. It's our first thing. It's not our last resort. It's the first thing. And oftentimes prayer will lead us to the practical next steps of what we're supposed to do as the spirit of God communicates to us. But what I want you to know and what I want you to see is please, please know the weapons that you have. Please lean into them and don't try to fight these demonic schemes with human means. Don't. I am telling you to stand and stand therefore and firm and praise and worship your God and seek him and build yourself up. Help me get this back. Because I told you that it causes confusion to the enemy. Come on. And I told you that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for the tearing down of strongholds and I told you that and I told you that it's not by power and that it's not by might but it's by the spirit of God who in 2nd Chronicles 20 said this battle does not belong to you and in Acts chapter 16 said pray and praise and worship me and watch your chains break And God is, spirit is here right now. He's here in Boca. He's here in Deerfield. He's with you wherever you are in the world right now, tuning in online. And he's saying, as you praise me and you worship me, something has to break. I said, something has to break in Jesus name. And these fine people, don't be distracted by them. They are just protecting you. So we don't have any lawsuits. But they are saying, and I hear the Spirit of God saying, you have no reason to fear. The battle belongs to me. And when we frustrate and confuse the enemy with our praise and with our worship, This weapon does not represent my ability. This weapon does not represent my smarts. 
about how good I am, about how I can figure things out for myself. This weapon represents praise and worship that isn't even going to need that much force to tear down the strongholds because it's not my strength and it's not my power, but it's in the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but are mighty in God. And so you frustrate the enemy. And you confuse the enemy, friend. You confuse him when you praise him through the disappointment. And when you praise him through the diagnosis. And when you praise him through the addiction. And when you praise him through the strongholds. And through all the things in Jesus' name. Something has to break. Something has to break. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, something has to break. Come on, sing. The dead will live. The dead will live again. There's resurrection power. Can you believe? The dead will live. The dead will live again. Nothing is impossible, God. The dead will live. Come on. The dead will live again because Christ rose again and his spirit lives within you. The dead things in your life, in your heart, the broken parts, even exiled parts and things you've just sent away and they can live again. Dreams, hopes can live again, can live again, can live again because of the spirit of God. And I just am wanting to tell you, is this an oversimplification? I don't think so. Is it simple? Yes. Your first line of defense, you better stand and you better praise and you better worship and you better declare the truth over the lies because that is your first step. It's the first and the most important thing and you gotta continue it. And I told you from the very beginning that what has been over you will be under your feet in Jesus' name. Come on, come on, come on, under your feet. anything. He can do anything. We have limitless faith. What agreement have you made? This says, but he can't do that. And that he can't fix this. And I'm just going to have to learn how to cope with that. He can do anything. We believe that. We believe that. Do you, church? Do you believe that? And what we're going to do right here, right now, is we're just going to allow a few moments just ministry time. I want you to, without hesitation, if you know what your something is, maybe you're with us week one, maybe you weren't, you still know there's, this is it, this is the thing. This is just, it's been overpowering me, it's been crushing me, it's been oppressing me. I've given up hope. I'm gonna invite you. And we're just gonna praise and we're just gonna worship for a few moments. And we're gonna lay hands on you. We're not gonna counsel you. We might not actually even get your name this in this moment, this morning, but we're just going to do what the Bible tells us to do, to lay hands on in faith and just let God's spirit minister to broken parts of your heart and your soul right now. And so what I want you to do at both of our locations is without hesitation, I want you to come forward. Come on. In Deerfield, I want you to move to the middle of the room. We have a prayer team. We have pastors. We're here to pray for you. We just want to believe with you in faith. And I just want you to, without hesitation, just say, what if God can? What if I have a spirit of Joshua and Caleb that says, but what if he will? But what if he does? And, they, and my enemies can become bread for me. Come on right now. I just want you to, without hesitation, make your way forward. Come on. Come on. He is here. He is here. Come on. Come on. Come on.
Come on. of this room, the rest of you just believe in faith, pray for breakthrough for those who need it right now. Thank you, Jesus. Spirit of God, come move in hearts. Spirit of God, the tearing down of strongholds. going to interrupt this. I'm not going to interrupt this. Stay here. If you want to stay here, I'm not going to interrupt this. Stay here. Stay here. We're going to draw towards the close of our service, but prayer and worship will continue. Let me say this, friends. There's a scripture, Acts chapter 16. We passed over it, but I want to come back to it as we prepare our hearts for Easter and for resurrection power. And it says this, pull that up for me, Acts chapter 16. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and they were singing hymns to God. What? And the prisoners were listening to them. There's prisoners that are listening in right now in hope. There's prisoners that are listening in. There's prisoners right now that are open in this time of year more than any other time of year to say, yeah, I'll try out church. I'll do an egg hunt thing. I'll see the little rides in the games and whatever. And I'll, that's, let me say, but they need to hear that there's resurrection power and that there is a God that loves them and has a purpose and a plan for them and can redeem and right every single wrong. And so I implore you this week between now and Friday, Saturday, Sunday for our services, invite people. The prisoners are listening. They're listening. Amen. And if you don't know God, if you don't know him like I know him, if you don't know that he loves you, that he created you on purpose and with a purpose, I'm just here to tell you right now. He proved his love time and time again, but he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, loved you, that he gave his only son that whoever would believe would not perish, but would have 
eternal life. The dead will live again. And all you have to do is profess faith in him. And I'm just gonna lead you in a prayer right now. I want you to pray it out loud after me, everybody at both of our locations, our church family online, come on right now, just say, dear God, I believe that you love me and that you sent your son to die for me. I believe that Jesus' sacrifice was enough. And God, from this day forward, you are my father and I am your child. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. All right, listen, I want us to stay in an atmosphere of worship. And you, you friends, you can stay. Mike is going to give us instructions. But at the end, if you haven't not, not yet come down for prayer and you want to, take that step of faith. We're going to stay in an atmosphere of prayer and of worship for the next several moments. Let's keep this going, okay? I love you. Remember that you matter, we care, and that Jesus loves you. Amen. 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 Wow. Wow, guys. Listen, if you prayed that prayer just now, we believe you made the best decision that you could ever make. Take 60 seconds to fill out this Connect card. It's in the seat back in front of you guys. Bring it to the welcome area. It's right outside those doors. We want to connect with you, okay? Uh, we have prayer partners that are going to be up at the front here for you if you want to continue to get prayer or if you need prayer or if you want to get prayer. Um, we have prayer partners right here for you. Come on down. Um, and the last thing is we have Easter coming up, guys. We've got these Easter invite cards that are somewhere in my pocket. Uh, grab some Easter invite cards, invite somebody, okay? Bring these with you, give them to a friend. Easter is the time when we want everybody coming to church. We want them to experience what you experienced today, guys. Listen, I hope you have an amazing Sunday. And remember, you matter, we care, and Jesus loves you.